for this um, webinar. I thought, well, we have been working on energy systems last few years, and that's a very nice example of a systems of systems. And Eric um, is helping us in organizing the systems of systems engine conference, a virtual conference that we'll do from Mellodalen uh, in June this year. So that is the trigger uh, to, to take this example and discuss it with you. And when I started to make this example, I thought, wow, um, this is quite a huge topic just before Christmas. And <clears throat> that, of course, in less than an hour. So I hope that uh, at the end, your head isn't uh, having too much headache because of all the uh, insights I hope that you will get out of this. It's quite a large task. Uh, uh, but let's start first with the United Nations. They have defined 17 sustainability development goals, uh, all goals that we have to meet globally in order to make sure uh, that we can live in a healthy uh, way on Earth uh, with all the billions of people that we are on Earth. So there are many things that we have to do in order uh, to really turn our current way of living in a good and sustainable way of living. And this is really a save the Earth set of goals. Uh, so this is a very massive, massive uh, goal and uh, one of the things that we see is that uh, we are in a hurry uh, because if you look at the CO2 in the atmosphere, the vertical um, axis here is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, the emissions. And what you see is that we only emit more and more and more CO2. Uh, and and every year that we want to keep the earth within two degrees temperature rise, uh, we need to decrease our CO2 emission uh, faster and faster. Eh? So we have been uh, too, uh, too passive uh, globally. Uh, so you see here that, that if we would have started in 2000, we would have a gradual path and now it's 2020 and we have to go in a very fast path uh, to zero emissions in uh, somewhere the, the, the farther future. If you really want to follow Paris, uh, then you get the right hand side where, where you see that we already need halving in 2030 uh, and, and we need to be uh, at zero before 2050. So one and a half degree is, is very questionable that we still will be able to achieve that. So one part of all these sustainability goals is how do we reduce uh, the CO2 and related emissions? And then let's see what I want to do today. So we started with the sustainability goals. And then I want to show you how multidimensional this whole space is around this CO2 problem. So it is a huge problem space. And then I dive into a very specific case uh, at micro level. And when we have looked at a very specific case, I zoom out and make a more generic look at the energy system. And from the energy system, I move out and show you a conceptual model. So the logic of this whole figure of content is the left-hand side <coughs> is concrete uh, systems at, at global level. The middle hand is a very specific example at micro level, and the right hand side is much more meta. Then we step aside and we look at how do we approach this type of problem. Yeah. So here we I show you a conceptual model that helps us to understand energy systems and think about it. Then we jump to a very specific problem that we get if we start to use uh, renewable energy, yeah, intermittency. Uh, the energy is not available all the time. Uh, then we move out and we look at how energy systems behave in time. And then we narrow further to electric grid. So that's a subset of energy systems. And we look specifically at the micro level and batteries and hydrogen. Uh, and then we finish to, by looking at the big picture and, and combine uh, energy systems and the concept of thinking and see what that means in terms of systems of systems engineering. Yeah, so that's the whole presentation that we will be going through. 
So let's first look at uh, this, these energy systems and realize that it has many dimensions. Uh, so a key aspect of systems engineering is that we take many viewpoints, many perspectives. So uh, recognizing the dimensions that play is relevant. Huh? And what you see is I showed you the sustainability goals. Huh? So there were already 17 different sustainability goals. Then there is a significant geographic aspect. Uh, then there is a functional aspect. What energy function do we look at? Do we look at how do we get it or how we use it, etc. cetera. Uh, then there are a lot of non-technical aspects, so there are social, economic, political, et cetera aspects. And then uh, we look at time. Uh, time can range from sub-second uh, to centuries. And, and that whole dimension at all those scales is relevant. So let's start with the geographic perspective. And, and you can say there is a macro perspective, uh, the whole Earth globally. Uh, you can zoom in on the European Union. Uh, within the European Union, I'm now in the Netherlands, so I'm zooming in on the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have the province of North Brabant. We see that here on top. And I call this the meso level, macro level, meso level. Uh, so this is a region of a country. And if we zoom in further, we get the town of Best, that is my, my hometown, a town of 30,000 inhabitants. And here at this spot, uh, there is my house. And my house has systems in it, uh, like uh, solar panels and heat pumps, and my new electric uh, uh, vehicle, the e app uh, And in those systems, this is the micro level of the systems, the individual systems. And within these systems, there are components. Uh, so there is a lot of technology in these systems. And, and, and I call it the nano level. And, and the energy system is relevant from uh, the macro until the nano level. And uh, we have global uh, heating. Uh, uh, and, 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 and some technologies may help us to cope with that. So let's go to some practical systems. So if we talk energy today, most people think about things like coal. Huh? We, we have many countries and the main energy generation is because we have coal and we transport the coal, we burn the coal to generate electricity and then we go in electric, electric form to a high voltage network. Uh, in the Netherlands, coal is one of the main ways that we generate our electricity nowadays. Uh, we can also uh, use oil and gas. So uh, in Norway, we have uh, float and point uh, processing and storage uh, units, and, and they store the oil and gas that we gain from subsea. Uh, so we have subsea systems where we uh, extract oil and gas, it's stored, it's transported in big tankers, then we store it again locally, and then in a gas power plant we can burn it again and uh, produce electricity that we use in high voltage network. And of course there are many, many more ways that we use it, but typically when we talk energy, people think about these kinds of uh, systems, and I show here the, uh, the traditional fossil systems, uh, and it's clear that in those fossil systems, we produce here a lot of CO2. Uh, and here we also produce a lot of CO2, although this is more clean uh, than, than the very dirty uh, coal that we uh, still are using a lot. So let's now step back. I showed you an energy system, or typically energy systems. Uh, and then we move to conceptual models. So let's have a look at, at systems at a much more conceptual level. So in this diagram, you see around here uh, the, the same photos as in the previous diagram. But in the middle, you see a simple conceptual model of all these type of energy systems. Uh, and the model is we somewhere get the resources from uh, the coal, the oil, and the gas. Yeah? We transport them. We process them often. We store them somewhere. And these three they, they may be there multiple times, eh? so we can extract and first process and then transport, 
or we can first extract it and store and then transport, etc. So the order of these things is depending on how we configure our whole system uh, and, and then we start using it. And, and these are generic functions that we see all the time. So many people that think about uh, energy systems are, are busy with these main functions. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, then, then they have a model. Oh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> and and, and this, this Wikipedia model, it shows here many types of energy. Uh, so there is here uh, the, the, the type of things that we harvest, primary sources, transporting it, converting it in secondary sources, transporting it, and then using it for different goals like transportation, building, industry, and agriculture. I added for this equation data centers. So nowadays we uh, are uh, using percentages of the total electricity in data centers uh, to be able to run Zoom meetings and all things. So that's a significant uh, user and it's a, a growing user as well of energy. Um, now you can uh, combine uh, these, these systems let me see, did I skip one? Oh, yes, here. So you can, com uh, so, so here, sorry, I, I'm mixing two slides. Here we see the original simple conceptual model that I showed you that people associate with energy systems. However, this is only the physical part, yeah, the, the things that we see. <coughs> and those physical systems, we control them and we have technical controls we have logistic controls, uh, and above them we have legal controls and all kinds of financial controls, incentives uh, to operate them in a certain way. And then we have many uh, enabling systems, systems that we need in order to make sure that we can run these systems. Uh, and, and finally, of course, we have all kinds of people and organizations that are involved in all these systems. Uh, and we have uh, the, the environment uh, that, that uh, where these systems are in and that we uh, want uh, to, to save from pollution and where we want to live in as well. Uh, so the, the bigger picture is it's not only about these physical systems, systems that people often associate with energy systems. It's also about a whole virtual set of systems that make it work and whole set of enabling systems that make it work and about many people and organizations. So, so the bigger picture is, is way broader than the, the very simple picture that I showed uh, in, in the previous uh, slide. Now, if we go from uh, these fossil systems, uh, then what we did see is, is that often we use the fossil systems to generate electricity. So you see that we can have all these systems in the fossil domain, uh, but we get them also in the electrical domain. Uh, so we have virtual and physical electrical systems uh, and, and at the uh, boundary between the two, there is the generation of electricity from oil, gas and coal, etc. cetera. Uh, so the whole system, uh, the whole energy system consists of many of these blocks uh, and, and all, uh, network together and that forms the total uh, energy system. So let's look at what happens if we start to introduce renewable energies besides all the fossil fuels that we had in the past and then we get intermittency. And, and let me start at micro level. And uh, what I show here in this simple graph is here is one year, 2020. This is my house. And uh, the blue part is the electricity that uh, the utility is delivering to me. And the orange reddish part is the energy that I'm delivering to the grid. And, and what you immediately see is there is a seasonal variation. Uh, we produce a lot of energy in the summer here, May, June, July. Huh? And uh, I am using a lot of energy in December and January uh, because I have heat pumps uh, to heat my house and, and uh, our insulation is far from perfect. 
Uh, so what you see is that um, uh, the, the, the uh, use uh, electricity is, is uh, very limited. Now, oops, here is something strange. My nice diagram isn't showing. Let me quickly switch to an alternative presentation. I don't know what happens here, but I do have a Uh, Zoom is now and then full of uh, uh, surprises as, as teams. So this is the same presentation. Now it shows the graphs that I also wanted to show. So, so this is uh, an entire year at the left hand side. And at the right hand side, you see a month, the month of October. Again, in orange, what I'm uh, supplying back, and in blue, what I'm using. And what you see, there is a lot of variation between days. So there are days with a lot of sun, and there are days with a little sun. There are days where I use a lot of energy. So there is a continuous variation in the amount of energy that I'm supplying as well as that I'm using. The variation in demand was already there. Yeah, but the variation in supply is new because I have added all these solar panels to my house. So suddenly we get much more um, intermittent energy that is put into the grid. And if you look within a day, then of course you see the same type of variation because during the day we have sun uh, and, and in the evening I'm using a lot of energy. And I guess that here my hot water supply is switched on and, and was heating up. Uh, so what you see is that the, the use is, is varying again and uh, that we mostly generate additional energy during daytime. Uh, so this, this energy use is varying all the time and um, it's varying at different time scales. So if we zoom out and let me see if I can switch back to the other presentation that is I think slightly nicer. Yeah. So if we now look at uh, the, the, the whole energy system, uh, then what we see on this slide is a time axis, a logarithmic time axis, uh, going from seconds to here a century at the right hand side. <clears throat> and on that axis, I show a number of relevant processes in the energy domain. And, and here, the bar in the middle is the way that our energy systems are currently uh, making sure that we have a stable grid. Uh, so if we have a short time span, then there is frequency containment reserve. So so at a very short time, we vary the frequency when we use a lot of energy and then we go for a little bit, we deviate a little bit from the 50 Hertz. And in that way we can cope with very fast variations in demand and supply of energy. And, and when uh, it becomes uh, too uh, unstable, we have reserves that we can switch on and make sure that we keep on uh, at an, a stable grid. Uh, and then there is an automatic way of doing that, a little bit slower. There is a manual way, so people switch on and off reserves. And then we switch to an other way of working where we have markets, so a financial way of handling, where we buy and sell uh, energy for uh, quarters per day, hours per day, or for days. Eh? And, and here you see there is an intraday market, huh? so day ahead market, right? <clears throat> where we look one day ahead <clears throat> and, and we, we arrange that we buy energy for the next day. Uh, and then there is the longer term uh, deals uh, where there are agreements like Amazon and Google uh, where they buy energy for years ahead. Uh, and, and then they have a stable and, and, and known price for the energy. So what you see is that whole way of controlling is in the small time scales, it's more technical control. Uh, but if you go to the larger time scales, we have an 
economic control. We have a set of uh, system of incentives uh, to make sure that, that we have the right amount of energy at the right moment and, and that we have a stable delivery of uh, energy. And then if you go further to the right, you see that a number of other things that are put here. And that is the assets of the energy system typically are there for decades. And so if we do anything uh, in the energy market, we, we take on a responsibility and, and uh, cost consequences for decades. And another aspect that we need to be aware of that is that a lot of the infrastructure, uh, if we want to build that, that there is a long lead time. So if you want to change the transmission network, uh, then people say, well, you, you have to start a decade before, or, or maybe five years before, before in order to make sure that you have the right transmission uh, network uh, that you need for a stable system. If you look at Germany, the energy vendor, they uh, knew early on that they needed uh, high voltage connections between north and south, because in the south you can harvest a lot of solar energy, in the north they can harvest a lot of uh, wind energy uh, uh, at sea, uh, and, and wind energy at sea is, is mostly in winter periods, and solar energy is mostly in winter uh, in, in summer periods. So it would be ideal to have a transmission network between south and north, yeah, because then you have both modalities and you can stabilize yeah, the way that this is working. Uh, and, and they knew that, and, and still they are not yet yeah, building a transmission system. While that would be a tremendous benefit to, uh, to stabilize and increase the capacity of their renewable energy systems. And, and if you go to distribution systems, those are the systems that operate at a lower um, energy level and a lower uh, voltage level, more local, yeah, that can be a little bit faster. But also there, you have to prepare years ahead. And so many of our utility scale solar in the Netherlands is not utilized fully because the distribution system is not yet dimensioned and to cope with that. Uh, so what you see is uh, you, you have to have really a big picture, long-term perspective to do the right things simply because many parts of the energy system are very big, very expensive, very long lasting. Uh, and, and, and that means uh, you have to start in time when you want to uh, adapt it. So let's look a little bit more at the electric grid. Uh, so at the left hand of this slide, you see how um, Wikipedia shows the electric grid uh, and, and you see many of those systems. And at the top, there is a high voltage grid, an extra high voltage grid. I've here to the right is summary. So that's the transmission grid. Uh, and typically that is very large, all things are very large. It's all very high power, so hundreds of megawatts. It's high, very high voltage, and because the higher the voltage, the lower uh, the losses, uh, but it also is very high cost. So if you do anything, you immediately talk uh, about billions. Yeah? And then we get a lot of uh, simpler grids uh, to, and followed by the distribution grids, and we get more local. Uh, and under distribution grid, oops, sorry, uh, we get all kinds of local networks at lower energies. And uh, so nowadays we do have a distribution grid. Uh, we do not really have neighborhood grids. Tesla is building all kinds of systems where they kind of build also neighborhood grids, uh, which, which can be stand alone, but can be connected to distribution grid. Huh? And then uh, we get uh, the, the home grids, uh, which we don't have either. But again, uh, companies like this, uh, Tesla, uh, they uh, make home grids. Uh, so you can be off grid if there is a power outage and still operate in your home. Uh, and, and what you see is that 
once we are at the bottom, uh, it is small, uh, it is a few to hundreds of kilowatts, it is uh, uh, 0 dot, uh, to 40 volt to, to 50 kilovolt, uh, and it is tens to hundreds kilo dollars in investments. Uh, so there's, there is a few orders of magnitude difference between the large scale things and the small scale things. And, and be aware that, that in our today's systems, um, there is a hard connection between all of these systems. Our 50 Hertz starts here in the big generators and that's the frequency in which there uh, a big axis is turning eh? and that couples through to, to all the way down to our local homes, our 50 Hertz. Eh? And, and all of that is, is synchronized and, and running in sync. And, and uh, that, that was a very stable and good working system in the past. But once you start to have all this distributed uh, power generation through with intermittent renewable energy sources, uh, the question is, well, maybe we need there a different paradigm. Huh? And another thing that you see happening is it's all AC, huh? uh, 50 Hertz. Uh, but but you also already see that 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 we now get high voltage DC eh? and 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 many of the new energy systems are producing DC and and so a question is when do we need AC when should we have DC when do we do that conversion so there are all kinds of uh, general questions in this whole electric grid. So how do we keep this whole grid of grids stable. So I think uh, that, that we'll move from the grid to a grid of grids of grids of grids, uh, multi-level grids. And, uh, but how do you keep that, that stable? And then the answer is, well, there are a few conceptual ways of doing that. And one is make sure that you have geographic smoothing. Uh, the example of Germany, where we have uh, wind in the north, uh, solar in the south, uh, but in general, the bigger the grid, the more geographic you connect things, the connection between Norway and the Netherlands is a good way to stabilize things. Uh, so Norway has a lot of uh, hydro uh, power. Uh, so if we do not need energy, we don't use it. If we do need it, we use the, uh, the Nordic energy in the Netherlands. Then there is time. Uh, so smoothing out in time. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by storing energy, so hydropower is a way to store it, uh, but batteries is another way of store it. And, and we need much more storage in order to stabilize the grid. And of course, when we store, you also have to retrieve it. And, and uh, again, to give an example of the many, many challenges that we face, um, I already explained, we do have problems in the Netherlands with the um, had a, the, the distribution grid and it takes five years to uh, increase its capacity. So our solar systems cannot be connected. A simple means that could help there is that the, the distribution network adds uh, battery storage, uh, like in, in Australia, Tesla built this big massive uh, battery system. If you would add the battery storage to distribution system, it can much better deal with those peak loads locally, uh, and and you can uh, have a, a grid with without extending its capacity, handling much more energy. However, legally, the companies, the DSOs that, that manage the uh, distribution networks, are not allowed to store and retrieve energy because they are legally only allowed to transport energy. So a technical viable and, and feasible solution is impossible because of legal uh, legislation uh, that we put in place for other good reasons. Uh, we can also do demand control. Uh, so uh, I showed you that I was heating uh, probably my, my hot water in, in the night. Uh, it would be better if, if it is done uh, during daytime because then I have the solar energy available. And in general, uh, <clears throat> we can switch on the heavy energy users when we have a surplus of 
uh, energy and we can ask them to uh, switch off when there is too much demand from it. And that means you have to incentivize uh, people, uh, you have to incentivize that people don't use energy when it is their shortage uh, and that we do use it when there is an oversupply. And of course, uh, the way we traditionally do it is we add generation capacity, we switch on biomass or gas or worse uh, suppliers of, of electrical energy. If you look at micro level, uh, again, my home. Huh? So in the Netherlands at the moment, we don't have any incentive to store energy. Huh? So, so at the moment, I don't have any battery, um, but I could add a battery to my house, house huh? if I would add 20 to 30 kilowatt hours, uh, then I would uh, be all using all the energy that I generate myself, except in the winter periods here, huh? because then I generate too little energy and, and, uh, and this uh, uh, battery is way too small to supply the energy in the winter months here. So if I would want to be uh, to handle the season variation, then I would have to store the surplus of energy here. Uh, this I supplied nearly 11 megawatt hours of energy here in the summer to the grid. <clears throat> and one way that, that we could do is we could electrolyze water so that we get hydrogen, store the hydrogen, and uh, in the winter use the hydrogen. And then I would get, uh, depending all the uh, losses that take place here, I could generate the 2.8, oops, the 2.8 megawatt hours that I'm using in the winter. Yeah. And <clears throat> so a way that you could, could cope with seasonal variation is that you uh, store it locally in, in a form that is um, uh, more affordable in size and cost than batteries. However, it's much less efficient. So <clears throat> let's take a step back and, and look at the whole big picture and systems of systems engineering. <coughs> what, I, what we have seen is that we have many layers of systems of systems. So you have the, the big systems, a number of them, and, and they all have these same uh, functions in them, and they all have a set of virtual systems to make them work, and there are people and organizations involved. Uh, and, and in the next layer, uh, there are smaller systems, more regional systems, more local systems, and it continues. We get really local systems, and then we get all the constituent systems. Yeah? So the, the macro, the meso, the micro, and the nano level. And, and at all these levels, there are people, organizations involved, uh, and all of them fit in the total environment. Yeah? And, and at this nano level, you see all the constituent systems, the heat pumps, the solar panels, the batteries, uh, and all these systems have to operate together in order to making it work. Um, so I was reading a question on, on slide uh, 18. Uh, so oops. Uh, here. So regarding image 18, to keep the group stable isn't necessary with big synchronous uh, generators that are from water, nuclear, coal, uh, to keep the frequency stable, e.g. E not synchronous like solar and wind can only be up to some 30%. So, so there's a, uh, this 30% depends on the amount of uh, grid that you have. Eh? So how much geographic smoothing do you apply, how much time smoothing, local storage do you apply, how much demand control do you apply. And, and in, in the current transmission and distribution grid in most countries, uh, you probably will end up in problems around, indeed somewhere around 30%. Yeah? Uh, but, but if we want to achieve Paris, uh, it means that our electric grid should very fast transition to be fully renewable uh, and, and, and you can debate 
uh, nuclear, you can debate biomass eh, because they uh, nuclear doesn't produce CO2, either doesn't produce CO2, but uh, that, that has limits in how much we can do. Uh, and biomass, which also has limits. So, so you will need much more wind, you will need much more solar, and it will go beyond uh, the 30% uh, where it, it, it's stable. And, and a question is then, and that's an open question, how much of the grid will run on this uh, um, uh, generator driven 50 hertz um, stability and, and how much uh, will we run on a more uh, synthetic uh, frequency and, and how much do we synchronize individual micro grids, meso grids and macro grids? And, and I formulate as a question. I, I don't know, and, and I think nobody exactly knows what is, is the right endpoint there. We, we are still inventing that is, is my thinking. So all these systems, all these levels, all these organizations, all these uh, people, and 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 so a major message is um, transitioning the energy system isn't a, a technical transition only. It is a transition that is partially technical. Well, there's a lot of things that need to happen in the technical world. It's also a transition in business models, economic systems, and so on. And it is also a transition in organizations, people, politics and social aspects uh, and and then uh, we have to fit all of this in uh, our geological and social and political environment uh. so it is a transition that has a tremendous amount of aspects that play a role and in that sense it is uh, a system of systems not only in technical sense but also in uh, the people uh, and societal uh, sense Yes, and that brings us to the Systems of Systems Engineering Conference 2021. It will be online if we are able to open up at that moment. We may have some local um, events as well in uh, uh, Wasteres in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, well, the, the theme that we picked is autonomous cyber-physical systems of systems. Uh, be aware that that in these energy systems, uh, there is a tremendous question when do they operate fully autonomous uh, and when do we as humans interfere with them? Uh, I showed you somewhere in one of the slides that in the minute range, uh, they operate autonomous and uh, they automatically switch on and switch uh, out of, uh, of uh, energy systems. Uh, and, and if you have an interest in the conference, you can submit papers until January 31. Uh, and then we review them, we tell you uh, mid-March whether we accept them, and then we need a final manuscript at uh, April 11. I have talked enough, I can talk for days about this topic, but you only about to be less than an hour. Well, thank you, Gerrit. Um, I think we'll go ahead with some of the questions and I, I have some in the chat, but maybe you want, you want to actually express your questions directly to Gerrit and he can pick up slide, slide 18. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. Uh, let me increase the size of my chat window. Do you want, do you want to... Um... Uh, actually, so, so the other one, one I, I briefly discussed already, uh, slide 18, and then Stephen has a question. Yep. Has there been any analysis of the total cost and environmental impact of the total systems mm -hmm. of systems for energy? Mm -hmm. uh, so the answer is yes. And, and, and again, be aware that <clears throat> you can do that at global level and at all intermediate levels. Uh, so there are papers that make estimates of the total investment that we need uh, and compare it uh, to the, the total GDP and the total uh, cost of the current uh, energy systems. Um, and, and, and similar estimates are at country level and at local level. 
uh, if you use an electric car, but it can see it's generated by coal, is it green in a diesel car? And the answer is yes, but of course it depends on the country. If you have a, a fully uh, coal generated country uh, like this, and it is indeed a dirty coal, uh, then the gain is of course quite small and can be even negative. Um, so so uh, the, the trick is you have to fast move the electric system to electric, uh, electric generation, renewable generation. Otherwise uh, we still generate too much CO2. At the same time, we have to uh, transition the transport system to other forms of, of uh, less CO2 producing systems. Uh, and at the moment, what you see happening is that small uh, mobility uh, has, seems to go to full electric using batteries uh, and, and, and large uh, transportation system, uh, long haul transportation, planes, shipping, etc. cetera. Uh, batteries are too heavy, too big, uh, too, too difficult. Uh, so, so then the question is, what is the alternative? Is it hydrogen? Is it methane? Is it synthetic fuel? Is it, well, there are many, many, uh, there's a proliferation of options still uh, in that uh, the, uh, thing. Uh, does it take into account construction and decommission EA the total cost and environmental impact? Uh, yes, so we in systems engineering, of course, advocate that. So to take the, the, the full lifetime cost, the full uh, um, uh, uh, footprint of a system. So again, if you go back to the electric car and you go back to solar panels, then you can do a calculation of how much does it cost to uh, mine all the lithium that we need in a battery uh, and then uh, uh, all, all the other steps involved. And, and then you still see that electric cars beat um, uh, fossil fuel cars. Uh, although, of course, you have to kind of earn back the initial cost of, of the lithium ion that you have to harvest and process, etc. cetera. And, and a continuous worry is that um, in, in all of these kind of things, uh, uh, there, there, the, the economic system may currently incentivize uh, that we harvest uh, lithium ion in a very environmental unfriendly way. Huh? So we have to make sure that we work at the full width and, and, and that if we uh, do shift resources that we shift in a way that they are not more detrimental instead of helping us. Uh, so all of these are good questions. Uh, and, and the answer is uh, the whole transition, in my opinion, is a complete no brainer. So, so we have to go mostly full electric. Uh, there are a number of things. Uh, so, so of course you have to use biomass if there is a biomass waste. If you are living in Sweden, uh, the, the, you produce a lot of biomass that you can use for good purposes and it is environmentally safe. In the Netherlands, we burn a tremendous amount of biomass, uh, and then we we destroy the the, the forests in, in Letland, Estland, U.S. and and other uh, countries that that see an economic incentive, and that is very detrimental again. Eh? So biomass is part of the solution. Nuclear maybe in some cases be part of the solution. However, there are already papers that also show that if you have nuclear then then in order because nuclear is very expensive you have to run it a lot of the time and because you run it a lot of the time you kind of squeeze out some of the renewable options so there is an there's an economic tension between nuclear and renewable options uh, so so nuclear uh, if finland does nuclear i can understand that in many other countries i would say well you have that many renewable options that, that I wouldn't do nuclear because uh, you, you may make your own uh, economic uh, equation more complicated. So now I stop talking because I, I can talk for this for days as you uh, see. So. <laughs> uh, well, well, one last remark about this, about this, this uh, agreement and diesel. There is a tremendous amount of misinformation also. Eh? So, so a problem is that, that there are a lot of uh, ill-defined, um, ill-informed uh, piece of information where they 
take the wrong data and then say, you see battery cars are only polluting or you see solar panels are only polluting. So yes, there is a pollution involved and an environmental footprint involved. Uh, but if you, if you start doing the calculation, you will see it is a no brainer, mostly. All right, uh, Yuan and, and Stephen, are you okay with the answers there? Yeah. I'd like to follow up on the, the, the this question about, because I, I agree with you in theory, electric cars should be greener than a diesel car. But I see misinformation on both sides um, yeah. and still do not see a sufficiently compelling reason for an electric car. And I agree with you in principle, it seems good, but then it, there's always, it depends and it, it's really hard. So if you take, say, a Toyota Prius, when they were first building Toyota Priuses, they were typically being scrapped after 13 years. Mm -hmm. on average, which mm -hmm. is not very green compared to, say, a Land Rover Defender, where 70% yeah, yeah. of all Land Rover Defenders ever built are still running. Mm -hmm. I own a Land Rover Defender, yeah. but not as an everyday car. So I still, you know, the, in theory, it makes sense. In my mind, it makes sense. But I still do not see, as an engineer, enough really compelling information that really demonstrates that the Toyota Prius is it, is uh, and, and again, again, so, so the challenge is you should not look at this only as an engineer, because part of the argument is um, why are some systems having a shorter lifetime than, than you like? Eh? That is partially because of the technological developments. Eh? Sure. So, so, so the EVs of today, the electric vehicles of today, they won't live that long because in, in 10 years from now, they are that much better yeah, that, that it, it doesn't make sense to, to prolong the life of that older car. Yeah? And, and then there is a next nasty thing. And that is, if we want to reach the final point that we have to reach in about 2050, yeah, then we see that in 2050, we need the clean solutions and not the dirty solutions. So we have to go through the learning path. Yeah? And we have to go through the economic industrial scale learning path. So we have to go scale up. And, and in that scaling up, yes, there will be two short living systems that don't give the full benefit that we want to see, as you indicate. Uh, but if we don't go through that, we will not reach that next point. But again, there's got to be balance. If we're always seeking to be more green, but in the process, we're throwing away more as we go through the development, then aren't we just as bad as the fashion industry where everyone buys a new set of clothes each year and throws away no, the clothes no, from last year? No, because the fashion industry doesn't have to uh, reach a dot on the horizon. We do have that. If we okay. do nothing, if you keep driving your Land Rover, you are still driving that 30 years from now and you will still produce the same amount of CO2. 30 years from now, all the energy, electric energy will be based on renewable, at least if we want to achieve Paris. If we do nothing, we don't have that, but for Paris, we need we need to get there. Yes, so, so Jan Johans and Berg Serger, eh, economy needs to be considered. Yes, definitely, yes. And so, so, so I started with the 17 sustainability development goals, because if you only look at the energy system, you will do the wrong things. Yeah? So, so you need to look uh, much broader. And, and this circular economy is, is, a, is a tremendous uh, set of challenges on top of only uh, uh, the CO2 problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, so so let, let me, let me uh, so, so why did I pick my home as, as an example? Uh, one of the things that, that in, in, in my hometown, we have a corporation a uh, foundation that, that is working on sustainability of the town. And uh, they had a goal and they said in 2030, we want to be uh, fully sustainable, have, have no CO2 emissions anymore. And I asked them simply, so how are you going to get there? What, what do you envision that you will do to get there? And then it became silent. Yeah? So I said, well, so let's make a roadmap. Let, let's just uh, use our imagination and see how we can get there. So. And, and, and so I made a roadmap. Uh, oops. We made a roadmap, I should say. So we made a roadmap. And, and in roadmap, uh, you look at, at 
many different aspects. You look at what's happening in society and, and, and what are the solutions you want to make and what is the legislation you need and what's the technology you need. And all these yellow note stickers are ideas of what we could be doing. And I ordered them in the roadmap. So the horizontal axis is a time axis here from past to the very long term, say uh, 2050. And here there are different, the objectives, the solutions, the means, technologies, the resources and the governance that you need. Uh, and then what may have to happen all over the place. Uh. And if you do that, you see that, that somewhere in 2050, you want to be mostly all electric yeah, and use much less energy than we to do today, where there's a lot of fossil fuel yeah, and, uh, and you have to move to here to here. Yeah. And if you know that, you say, so now let's fill it in step by step. And then we have an idea how we do get there. Yeah. And, and when you have that, you can also start to ask all our questions, a lot of questions like, so what does that mean in terms of recycling? How do we cope with those resources? How do we make sure, etc.? Yes, thank you, Janet. I think that was an excellent slide. I mean, I actually had my own question. How do you actually consider the time dimension in all this? And I think this is part of it, right? Um, creating these kind of roadmaps um, around the kind of things that you mentioned in terms of political, economical, technical aspects. Um, but uh, it, it's probably not an easy task. <laughs> yeah. so, no, sir, so I, I'm reading Johan's comments. Eh? You should probably uh, more focus on system stability on the grid. Eh? So, so I, uh, the interesting thing is there are very, very many people involved. Eh? So if I'm talking with people in, in uh, Norwegian industry, they're all oil and gas people. And they all think about how can we produce a little bit uh, less CO2 if we harvest oil and gas from the sea. Yeah? And, and then if we talk with the, 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 the big network companies, Tenet in the Netherlands and, and the distribution companies, they all have a huge focus on, on stability of, of the grid. And of course, because that, that is uh, um, a, a major good in, in our uh, infrastructure. Yeah? And, and, and so every time you take another, another stakeholder, they have a different thing which they highly emphasize. And, and, and of course, the essence of system ending is all of these aspects are very important. And, and uh, we have to juggle all of them. <laughs> and, and the stability thing is a thing where you, well, you, you can do a study in it and, and, and still don't know everything about it. All right. Thank you, Harita. I think we have to uh, stop the, <laughs> the presentation here now and the questions. Um, if I can get, just share my screen, um, uh, the last slide here. Um, so this will uh, pop up, the, this today's event will pop up on the um, our webpage eventually with the recording. But um, between um, now and um, and the next seminar, of course, there's uh, Christmas and all that. Um, here's the next seminar, by the way, on the 14th of January. So we will be looking at uh, modeling, etc., to how you can use enterprise architect, digital twins, business value orientation to manage complex systems. Um, that uh, will be done by a couple of Brits. So that will be another international event. <laughs> And between uh, now and then, as I said, it's Christmas and it's uh, new, new Year. So we all wish you a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And uh, thank you, Gerrit, uh, for a very, uh, should I say, inspiring and, and challenging <laughs> uh, presentation. And I think we need all the systems engineering capability <laughs> and capacity we can get for the future to make yeah, it. I put, I put the links in the chat. So the links of the, the link to the slides and link to more of these uh, kind of information. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Well, Thank yes. you, uh, thank you, Harit. Thank you all yes. for participating, and um, well, see you soon, and happy holidays. Yeah, good you. Oh, oh, bye bye.